Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'm gonna talk about double integrals. Probably the best way to introduce double integrals is to begin with a single integral. So in this case, I have the integral from negative one to two of x cubed minus four x plus six dx. And we know that we can think of our integrand as some curve in two-dimensional space. And our limits of integration, negative one to two, is an interval over which we are integrating. Now we have a graphical interpretation here. If we're lucky enough to have a curve that is always positive on our interval, then our single integral measures the area between our curve and the x-axis on this interval, in this case from negative one to two. A double integral will act very much the same, but now our integrand is gonna be a surface and our limits of integration describe some region on the xy plane. So in this case, I have a rectangular region on the xy plane and because I'm lucky enough to have a surface that is always positive over our interval, our double integral is gonna measure the volume between our surface and this region on the xy plane. So we can kind of imagine it like you just saw here in our animation. We are measuring the volume that's trapped between this yellow surface on top and the region that we have on the xy plane. Now we can actually crunch the numbers for this particular integral. So here's how you might see this set up on say a worksheet or a quiz or something. Um, they don't set up the double integral for you. You have to do that yourself. And you'll notice here that our differential is written as dA instead of the previous slide where it said dx dy or dy dx. But remember that we are integrating with respect to a small change in area on the xy plane. So here's our region on the xy plane. So just like we had dx in our AP Calc BC class, for a double integral we have a dA, which means we're integrating with respect to a small change in area. Well, this small change in area is like a little rectangle that is formed by taking a small change in x, dx, and a small change in y, dy. And you guys know that the area of a rectangle is length times width, so we can either write dA as dx dy or as dy dx, depending on how we want to set up the problem. In this case, I'm going to write my dA as dx dy. Now my setup here, um, let's see, I want to make sure everything matches up here. So let me erase some of this clutter and let me show you how to interpret what we have going on on the screen here. So first of all, these integrals are gonna be computed inside out. So this double integral is essentially like computing two separate problems where I compute the inner integral first, and then after I'm done with that, I can compute the outer integral second. It's very important to get that order correct because otherwise you're gonna end up with funny looking incorrect answers. Now let's make sure that our dy and our limits of integration match. So here we can see that our region on the xy plane is bounded by y equals negative 2 pi and y equals pi. So let's look at our dy integral here and yep that looks good. We are integrating from negative 2 pi to pi. We can kind of ignore our outermost integral to start with, so let's just look at this yellow single integral on the interior of our, of our double integral. All we have to think about is, what is the antiderivative of the sine of y with respect to y? What's the antiderivative of cosine of x with respect to y, where we're treating cosine of x constant relative to y, so we're treating it like a constant, and then what's the integral of two with respect to y? which is for sure a constant relative to y. Well, we know that the antiderivative of sine of y with respect to y is negative cosine of y. Um, now this is interesting. The antiderivative of the cosine of x is y cosine of x because we're treating cosine of x as a constant relative to y. So what's the derivative or what's the integral of a constant? Well, that constant times our variable in this case y. And then similarly, two truly is a constant, you don't even have to imagine here. Um, we don't have to hold anything constant, two is a constant, and the integral of two with respect to y is two y. 
And we do have to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus here, because this was a definite integral. And so for our definite integral, we had bounds. y was running from negative 2 pi to positive pi. So I'm going to plug in each of those values. Um, I'm going to plug in y equals pi for every instance of y, minus I'm going to plug in negative 2 pi for every instance of y. Now, I'm not showing all of that work here, but this is what you get once you combine those. And now we've turned this problem into something much more familiar, because now this is just a single integral with respect to x, which is what you spent a lot of your school year doing last year. So you guys know how to crunch the numbers on that. Uh, but what I can offer you guys is a graphical interpretation of this expression. So our new integrand, this is not just a mess of constants and functions in terms of x. Rather, this is actually a function that sweeps out vertical area cross sections as x varies from these limits of integration, 0 to pi. So what I want you guys to imagine is that this green integrand that you see on my screen is sweeping out area cross sections. You can see them animated here going from left to right as x goes from 0 to pi. And what happens is as we sweep out these area cross sections, we accumulate the volume that's trapped between our surface and our region on the xy plane. So we're going to continue doing some calculus here. So we're going to compute some antiderivatives. The antiderivative of 2 with respect to x is 2x. 6 pi gives us 6 pi x. And then 3 pi cosine of x gives us 3 pi sine of x. Again, we have to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus here. Notice how I'm writing x equals pi and x equals 0. Now that I've got a lot of different variables floating around in my problem, uh, it does make sense to label what we're plugging in. I don't, I don't just write 0 and pi. I write x equals 0 and x equals pi, so I don't mix up x's and y's. When you plug it all in, you get 2 pi plus 6 pi squared. And our graphical interpretation here is that is the volume that is trapped between our surface and the xy plane over that rectangular region that we integrated over. Now, uh, this is specifically a volume calculation because we're lucky enough to have a piece of surface that is always above the xy plane. Um, I'll tell you what happens later on when you don't have that happen. Um, and then if you look at this animated GIF here, you, could, you guys can kind of see um, I gave you the two-dimensional picture, the region on the xy plane that we're sweeping out as x goes from 0 to pi. And you can also look at the three-dimensional result of that. Now, if you'd like a picture of what that um, solid looks like that we just computed the volume of, here it is. So we found the volume of that green solid that you guys can see on the screen. Now, I made a somewhat arbitrary choice. Right at the beginning, I said, oh, okay, so we're integrating, our double integral is computed um, as a dA integral. We're integrating with respect to a small change in area on the xy plane. And I said a small change in area on the xy plane is going to look like a little rectangle. And then I pointed out, remember, uh, the area of a rectangle is length times width, or base times height. In this case, the base being dx and the height being dy. And then I said, you can kind of pick here. dA can either be dy dx or it can be dx dy because a, a rectangle doesn't carry the order in which uh, the, the base and the height were multiplied with each other. So my previous example I did um, as a dy dx integral. Now I'm going to repeat the calculation as a dx dy integral. And notice how everything matches the initial setup. So remember we compute these integrals inside out. So I'm going to do this innermost integral first. And then when I'm done, I'm going to compute my outermost integral. Sometimes students will try to um, go from left to right or something and mix up which part of the integral matches with which other part of the integral. But it's always an inside out setup like this. So I know that my um, differential dx matches with 0 and pi from our setup on the previous slide. So algebraically, this is pretty straightforward. I just need the antiderivative of the sine of y with respect to x. Well, remember that y is constant relative to x here. So 
Uh, that's a really easy integral to compute. The integral of sine of y with respect to x is x sine of y. The antiderivative of the cosine of x with respect to x is sine of x. And the integral of 2 with respect to x is 2x. Now I'm going to plug in x equals pi and x equals 0. And then I'm going to subtract, and here it is. Now this green integrand has a meaning to it, um, a graphical interpretation. And again, it's a function that sweeps out area cross-sections, but this time our area cross-sections are horizontal. Um, they're going from negative 2 pi to pi. So you can see this picture here. It's basically the same picture that we saw on the previous slide, but just kind of rotated 90 degrees, right? It's just kind of the orthogonal version of what we saw before. I'm still sweeping out area cross-sections. Um, I still have the same rectangular region on the xy plane, but now you can see that we're following these in a slightly different direction with respect to a change in y because our outermost integral is a dy integral. So our final area sweep is going to be sweeping out this area, um, sweeping out these area cross-sections as y varies from negative 2 pi to pi. And as I, as I integrate those, those area cross-sections, I accumulate the volume. And unsurprisingly, this worked out the way it should. We got the same volume that we did on the previous slide. Um, we did it with a different area cross-section formula, but we did, in the end, describe the same region. So we still got 2 pi plus 6 pi squared. Now, guys, uh, these are calculations where you, you're going to notice I'm kind of skipping some steps, right? Um, my expectation is that you guys will be able to fill in those steps. In fact, I have a worksheet for you where you're, you're going to get to practice all of these sorts of problems from the slideshow and fill in the gaps that you see in my, in my notes here, where you can kind of fill in the algebraic steps that are missing, the number crunching that's missing. Now, again, guys, you are going to see the same exact shape here. So, um, again, we have the same surface, the same region, on the xy plane, all we did was sweep out our area cross sections in a different direction, but we get the same solid region and we get the same volume for that solid region. If you guys want a quick summary here, um, I do have a little summary of how to set up a dx dy integral versus a dy dx integral, but really uh, this just formalizes what I showed you on the previous slide how we're holding one variable constant and then integrating with respect to the other. Now, um, you just work inside out. So in this example, or in this setup, we are holding um, y constant and allowing x to vary. We're integrating with respect to x. We're going to get some antiderivative. And we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus there. Then we get to a single integral. And the integrand represents um, the area of a cross-section, as in this case y is allowed to vary, and as we accumulate those area cross-sections, we get volume. Um, you can also do this as a dy dx integral. All right, let's try one more quick example here. So I have a new surface this time. f of xy is equal to 2 sine xy minus 1, and I have a new rectangular region on the xy plane, and I'm going to calculate my double integral. Now, again, I get to choose if I want to do this as a dy dx integral or a dx dy integral. Over a rectangular region, it really doesn't matter which one you pick as long as there's consistency between the setup and how you write your double integral. Uh, later on down the line, when we start looking at non-rectangular regions, then things have to be a little bit more precise because sometimes there is a better way to set up your double integral either as a dx dy or as a dy dx. But what you'll notice here is that I am consistent. I have a dx integral where x varies from negative 4 to 4, which is the setup that was given to us in the problem. So this looks pretty good. Um, honestly, the rest of this is mostly number crunching. Um, I'll, I'll kind of skip through some steps because you guys will get the chance to verify these steps on a little worksheet that I created for you. But I know that the antiderivative of 2 sine of xy with respect to x is negative 2 cosine of xy over y. This is interesting. This over y 
um, we are treating our variable y as constant relative to x. So this is almost like integrating 2 sine of, say, 5x or something, right? And so think about how you would get a 1 fifth um, if we had sine of 5x, but in this case, we get a 1 over y. So don't be thrown off by that. Um, these integrals are interesting and a little bit unfamiliar at first until you start to get used to the idea of holding the other variable constant while you allow the variable of interest to vary. And then uh, this next one's easier. The antiderivative of 1 with respect to x is x. Now we have to plug in x equals 4 and x equals negative 4. I'll let you guys fill in some of these gaps here for simplifying. But um, we have some symmetry in our plot right here. And that symmetry in the plot actually turns into some beautiful symmetry in our algebra. We get a ton of cancellation. And this, this uh, huge integral here condenses down to the single integral from negative 3 to 3 of negative 8 dy. Now the antiderivative of negative 8 with respect to y is negative 8y. I'm going to plug in y equals 3, y equals negative 3, and I'm going to subtract, and I get negative 48. Now, sometimes students will get thrown off by a calculation like this because they'll say, wait, 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 you told me that this was volume, and this is a negative number, and, and volume is never negative. So how did this end up negative? Well, the thing to remember is my initial example was where I had a surface that was always completely above the xy plane. Um, and so in that case, it was a true volume calculation. But in this picture, I have parts of the surface that are above the xy plane and parts of the surface that are below the xy plane. And so this is really kind of like a signed volume or a net volume calculation. Um, I like to just write it as volume above minus volume below. Really what we're computing here is the volume um, between the surface and the xy plane that's above the region minus the volume that's between the surface and the xy plane that's below the xy plane, below the region. So volume above minus volume below. And this negative result tells us that um, there is more volume below the xy plane than there is above the xy plane, which you can visually verify to yourself. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Tune into my next video, and I'm going to talk about how to do a double integral over a non-rectangular region.